Western F-16 fighter jets have arrived in Ukraine, and we're finally getting some initial reports on how they're performing in combat. How does the F-16 match up against the Russian fighters they'll be flying against? What tactics and strategies will Ukraine deploy them with? And which types of new support aircraft might significantly enhance the F-16's firepower? I'll say right off the bat, if I've learned anything covering this war so far, it's that there's a tendency to get overhyped on weapon systems like the F-16 and create outsized, unrealistic expectations for the effect that they'll have on the war in Ukraine. On the other hand, there's also this concentrated effort by the pro-Russian media to downplay the positive, cumulative effect that weapon systems like the F-16 have. I think you personally would rather me just give you the straight skinny, no bullshit assessment of what's going on. A total of around 85 F-16s have been pledged by all the different NATO countries. Of that, six have been delivered so far and are in active combat operations. The rest are going to take years to arrive in batches. By August 27th, these F-16s were deployed for the first time in active combat. I wanted to wait until now, when we have some of those facts, to give you an assessment. The F-16 initially successfully intercepted and shot down incoming Russian cruise missiles and drones. This mission is vital for Ukraine right now from a strategic point of view because the Russian missiles are aimed at their power generation facilities. But August 29th saw one of the worst Russian missile attacks when 74 drones and five missiles were launched at them. A Ukrainian F-16 pilot who goes by the call sign Moonfish was responding to this wave of Russian missiles. During the engagement, radio operators lost contact with Moonfish's F-16, and the Ukrainian government confirmed his plane crashed and the pilot was KIA. But there's no word yet on whether it was shot down, had a mechanical error, or something else happened. One possible piece of evidence that it wasn't shot down comes from the fact that the Russian Ministry of Defense offered a 15 million ruble reward for shooting down the first F-16, or roughly 200,000 American dollars, so we probably would have seen someone try to claim that prize. However, the thing that jumps out to me most about this engagement is that it reveals to us initial indication of how the Ukrainian Air Force's strategy will play out with the F-16. But before we continue, this content wouldn't be possible without this video's sponsor, AG1, a daily foundational nutrition supplement for folks on the move. AG1 can support all areas of your body's health, immune system, and natural defense. I love how easy it is to incorporate AG1 into my daily routine. Just one scoop packs 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sources ingredients to up my daily intake of nutrients. After taking AG1, I feel much more energy and more calm. It's a great way to cut back on coffee, and I don't think I'm alone. In a study conducted on 35 healthy adults, over 97% felt an energy boost and 94% noted the calming effects. Gluten, dairy, GMO, and lactose-free, AG1 sources the best ingredients and is NSF certified for sports to ensure safety and quality. Head to my link in the description below to get a free one-year supply of AG vitamin D3 plus K2 plus five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase of AG1. Notice how the aircraft was not lost flying near Kursk or Sumy. It wasn't lost near the border while dropping glide bombs. It appears that early assessments were accurate and Ukraine is using the F-16 so far in an air defense role to intercept these incoming missiles. And we'll get more into why exactly that is now. One of the huge advantages Ukraine is about to gain that has a huge impact on the F-16 that a lot of people aren't talking about for some reason is the Saab 340 airborne early warning radar aircraft. Sweden announced in May that they were sending two of these, which will significantly enhance the air and sea surveillance capabilities for Ukraine. Ukraine. This gets talked about a lot less, I think, because it's not a sexy F-16 firing missiles at people's faces, but it's actually going to have a considerable impact because it's a completely new capability. Currently, Ukraine has no radar aircraft in their inventory. Oh, is it just me? Does it look real cozy in there? That's some nice gamer chairs. The only way to take more full advantage of the F-16 and its weapons is with this asset. Flying an F-16 without being backed up by this type of radar aircraft is like shooting a rifle without an ACOG scope. You know, pilots in the comments section can tell me how jacked up or not that analogy is. This is essentially a twin turbo prop plane with a fancy high-tech radar slapped on top of it and software made specifically to communicate with the F-16. It absolutely kills me in my heart of hearts to use this defense buzzword, but it's... Uh, it's a force multiplier. 
The reason it's a force multiplier is because its radar can identify and track incoming missiles at very far distances and then pass that target data to the F-16's weapon systems. It's like when you use the satellite uplink in Command and Conquer to reveal the fog of war of the battlefield and it gives you that clear view of the enemy movements. Once these two aircraft are paired with the F-16, that is when we might start to see the Ukrainian F-16 switch over to a more offensive role. Their only downside is that these radar aircraft only fly at about 300 miles per hour, and we've seen Russia's aircraft that fly faster. They've already lost two of those radar aircraft. However, Ukrainian pilots are fighting with some disadvantages, right? Their Russian adversaries outnumber them in total aircraft 13 times over, and Russian pilots have access to the latest versions of Eastern fighters and, more importantly, weapons. Even when Ukrainians and Russians fly the same type of aircraft, like the MiG-29 or Su-27, the updated Russian versions almost always have better radars and longer range missiles. Ukrainian pilots have survived this long by being crafty, flying so low that the treetops scratch paint from the jets, striking quickly and then retreating back under the cover of their air defense network. Using hit and run tactics like this, Ukraine claims to have shot down 342 Russian planes, 325 helicopters after two years of fighting. That's right, so around 10% of the Russian Air Force's total strength, but they're still playing a losing game. According to the open source intelligence blog Oryxy, Ukraine has lost 77 combat aircraft since the start of the war, leaving them with only 72 fighter jets as early as August of 2024. By contrast, Russia still has over 802 fighter aircraft, and they still have the manufacturing and training pipelines to replace those combat losses. It's a lot harder to capture an intact fighter jet than an abandoned tank or firearm, so Ukraine has to safeguard the last airworthy planes and pilots that they have left. On average, for instance, Ukrainian pilots fly 20 times fewer sorties than their Russian counterparts. What all that adds up to is that Russia is able to take advantage of their local air superiority over some sections of the front lines. This allows them to launch missiles, drones, glide bomb attacks against Ukrainian cities and military formations. Throughout each phase of the war, we've seen different assets, I think, become important based on geography, time of year, location of the fighting. For example, Javelin missiles were vital early in the war to stop Russian armored assaults. Now, Russian glide bombs have been very effective at this stage in the war at destroying trenches, defensive fortifications, and built up areas, allowing their infantry to advance. With the only major source of Soviet style fighter jets currently shooting at them, Ukraine has asked their Western partners for Western planes early and often. But the US government and other Western leaders were initially very resistant to the idea, fearing that it would providing these type of high profile weapons like jets and tanks could escalate into all out. NATO versus Russia apocalypse. It wasn't until August 2023 that the US allowed the transfer of F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. But this only started the long process of training pilots, certifying maintenance crews, beefing up Ukrainian air bases to protect new jets. For one, the F-16 is available in large numbers from a wide variety of Western countries. The jet is the world's most common fixed wing aircraft in military service with 2,145 fighting Falcons operational in 25 different countries, Denmark, Norway, Netherlands, they were the first to pledge their F-16s to the Ukrainian cause, replacing the older platforms with shiny new F-35s. The first jets to actually arrive in Ukraine are the Danish F-16AM and BM fighters. These are single and two-seater variants respectively, and they were first purchased back in 1980. In the mid-1990s, the Danish aircraft went through what was called the F-16 Midlife Update, or the MLU program, updating the aircraft with performance and reliability upgrades an improved radar, new modular mission computer, and access to the latest and greatest in NATO airborne weaponry. And this is gonna be huge when we focus on that weaponry aspect. These Danish jets, they aren't as advanced as like the F-16C and D version that the US flies, but they're still competent enough to provide a big step up in capability for Ukrainian pilots who are used to using 1980s Soviet jets. However, we need to keep in mind that the airframes being sent to Ukraine are 1980s F-16s now, so they've They've been around for a minute. The F-16 uses an all-digital cockpit with computerized fly-by-wire controls that interpret the pilot's inputs and translates them into control movements, taking into account things like the plane's speed, thrust setting, and angle of attack. 
the F-16 was actually built with some inherent instability to improve maneuverability. So it needs computer assets to handle all of the extra flight dynamics. But the MiG-29 and Su-27, they had great flight performance characteristics themselves. So the added agility isn't what Ukrainian pilots are most excited about here. Let's talk weapons, because adopting a Western jet opens up a whole new arsenal of advanced NATO weaponry since the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. Ukraine was essentially locked into the tech level of the time since most of the USSR's military aviation industry ended up in what was now the Russian Federation. Purchasing new aircraft armaments wasn't a priority in the cash-strapped country since very few foresaw a future when Russia would potentially invade. This means that Ukraine was forced to defend themselves in 2022 with basically 1980s era R-60 infrared and R-27 semi-active missiles on their jets. The R-27 especially left Ukrainian pilots lacking long-range capabilities since the semi-active seeker head meant that they had to keep the fighter's nose pointed at a target to keep it locked for the entirety of the missile's flight time. Meanwhile, Russian pilots equipped with the R-77 active radar missile had fire and forget capability, allowing them to launch and immediately pull away to evade return fire while still having a reasonable chance of scoring a hit. It gave them a major advantage. Active radar missiles have a small radar dish in their nose that allows them to to find and pursue their own targets once launched. Now, illuminating a target with your fighter's larger and more powerful radar for as long as possible still makes active radar missiles more accurate, but if you need to pull away or lose lock for some other reason, it's a huge advantage firing a missile that can pick up the slack on its own. NATO has several varieties of active radar missiles, and the AIM-120 AMRAAM missiles that arm the F-16 are some of the best in the business. First deployed in 1991, the AIM-120 has been continually upgraded for years and earned a fearsome reputation as an accurate and deadly missile for beyond visual range combat. Depending on the exact version, the AMRAM can reach out and touch someone at 100 miles or more. Though exact missile ranges are classified and can vary a lot depending on altitude, speed. Combined with the AIM-9 Sidewinder infrared missile for close-in engagements, the F-16 gives Ukraine access to both long and short range weapons with fire and forget capability, finally putting them on equal footing to some degree with their Russian opponents, at least in terms of air-to-air -air armament. But the F-16 is a multi-role fighter, more than capable of unleashing hell on ground targets too. Ukraine has been able to jury-rig some NATO ordnance onto their Su-24 bomb like the Storm Shadow and AGM-88 harm missiles, but with the F-16 now in service, they can fully integrate these weapons and more into the fighter systems. That unlocks the full functionality of NATO air-to-ground ordnance thanks to modular mission computers that are added during the MLU update on specifically the Danish airframes. To use the AGM-88 harm missiles as an example, these weapons were built to hunt and destroy enemy radar and anti-aircraft batteries. Anything that emits a radar signal, the harm can lock onto and home in using its own receiver. But the Harm has two additional modes that it can run that synergize with the launch platform's larger suite of sensors, making the missile not only more versatile, but also extending the engagement range out to over 80 nautical miles. Ukraine wasn't able to tap into the harm's full potential by just strapping them onto an ex-Soviet bomber. And this additional capability can really make the Russian radar sets and air defense batteries sweeter of a deal. Knowing the anti-radiation missiles like the harm are operational somewhere along the front lines means that enemy radar operators completely change their behavior, turning radars on only intermittently to avoid having a high-speed missile ride the beam right back to them. These are known as suppression of enemy air defense missions or seed and it's a mission type that the F-16 excels at, which leads into another interesting aspect of the F-16 that'll be a huge change for the Ukrainian pilots, the radar and sensor systems. The F-16AM comes equipped with the AN-APG-66 2A radar, able to detect most targets out past 52 mile mark. Like the rest of the AM and BM aircraft, the 66VA-2 isn't the best radar available for the F-16, but it has way better signal processing capabilities than anything that the Ukrainians have used before. The APG-66 can pick out targets in challenging radar environments, like heavily ground cluttered areas or skies that are saturated with jamming. The fire control computer can track up to 10 targets at a 
time and engage six simultaneously with separate AMRAAM missiles. All of the information from the radar and fire control computer are presented to the pilot throughout multifunctional displays, making it much easier for pilots to manage the data and preserve their situational awareness when the missiles start flying. Pilots switching over from the old Soviet jets described the most radical shift in their training was just getting used to the digital cockpit of the F-16. Most modern combat aircraft have something called a radar warning receiver, which detects and warns the pilot whenever a radar beam passes over the aircraft or locks on. But the RWR in many of Ukraine's jets was either very basic or just plain broken, providing very little context of what sort of radars were in the theater with them and where potential threats might be coming from. One of the most important devices is the warning system, which allows us to roughly understand from where the enemy is coming and intends to attack us, or from where the missile is coming. Since this system is outdated, we, unfortunately, cannot detect the whole variety of weapons the Russian Federation is using against us. Everything is quite primitive, old, and time has not been kind to it, unfortunately. Instead of just simple direction and signal strength indicators, like in the older MiG-29, the F-16's RWR provides the pilot with identification codes, radar modes, relative signal levels, and does a much better job of informing the pilot what's a friendly contact, what's an imminent threat, or what isn't a threat or might soon be a threat. Combined with information from the radar and data link displays, the pilot has a much more complete tactical picture of the airspace and how an engagement's developing. When missiles can strike within seconds from beyond visual range, a good RWR system helps pilots predict and respond to the battle. Now, looking at the photos and videos of the August 4th announcement, Ukraine showed off their F-16s in an air-to-air -air configuration, where it was seen with AMRAAM AIM-9 missiles mounted on the hardpoints. This led us casual observers to believe the new fighters would be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russia's best to battle for air superiority over the skies of Ukraine. But looking a little closer, the Ukrainian F-16s were loaded with AIM-9 sidewinders and training versions versions of the AIM-120B. Both of these are older and less capable variants from the current generation AIM-9X and AIM-120D, although they're both still capable weapons in both short and medium range combat. Why not give Ukraine the latest and greatest weapons now that they have fighters that can actually use them? There's two possible reasons for this. One, any F-16 jet flying over Ukraine are going to be prime targets for Russia, not just from a strategic value of depleting a limited resource, but also for the political points that they'd score from a successful kill of an advanced Western fighter jet. That means there's also a high likelihood that any weapons mounted on the downed fighter could fall into Russia and by extension, Chinese hands. In fact, it was a dud Sidewinder missile that got lodged in a Chinese MiG-17 during the second Taiwan Strait crisis of 19. 58 that allowed the Soviet Union to reverse engineer the heat-seeking missile into their own K-13 weapon. The US and NATO may not want to risk the most advanced weapons providing an intelligence coup for potential adversaries who could either reverse engineer it for themselves or develop effective countermeasures against them. However, that seems unlikely given that the United States already made statements that the AIM-9X and other top-of-the-line weapons will eventually be making their way to Ukraine at a unspecified date. It's possible the displayed weapons are just a bit of a misdirection against Against Russia, hiding Ukraine's true armament and capabilities until they actually meet the F-16s in battle for the first time. Russia has been bombarding Ukrainian military and civilian targets with missiles, drones, and glide bombs of all kinds since the start of the invasion. Ukraine has a defensive network that they inherited from the breakup of the Soviet Union, and the network has since been reinforced by Western systems like American Patriot batteries and German anti-aircraft guns, but Russia's tactic of saturating Ukraine's air defense systems through swarms of cheaper, less sophisticated drones has been surprisingly effective. By December 2023, Russia had already fired 3,700 Iranian-made Shahed drones and over 7,400 missiles of various types. Ukraine has only been able to intercept between 80 and 20% of the missiles, depending on how many munitions they had during the war. It's not easy watching your cities get bombarded for years, but there's only so many expensive interceptor missiles and AA platforms to go around. F-16s can find small targets like UAVs and cruise missiles much more easily with their advanced sensors than older MiGs, and that frees up a lot of the older platforms to tackle riskier missions near the front lines, potentially. As counterintuitive as it sounds to use the less advanced jets along the front line, older Ukrainian pilots have a lot of experience flying these jets against the Russians and know how to get the most out of them. They can conduct close air support and harassing missions in support of Ukrainian ground operations, while pilots switching over to the F-16 gain flight hours and cut their teeth on less dangerous targets over their home turf. It takes around 18 months to fully qualify a new pilot on the F-16 
2016, according to United States Air Force estimates. And that's with a fully mature training program in place. And for reference, the Ukrainian pilots got about six months of training. The F-16 on display during the August 4th announcement also had another piece of kit on those wings besides missiles. If you look closely at one of the pylons, you'll notice one of them is looking a little bit bulkier than the others. It even looks like it has camera lenses and little vents on it. That's the combination of pylon integrated dispensing system and electronic combat integrated pylon system, the PIDs and ESIPs. So those are additional defensive modules that are jointly produced by the Israeli company Elbit Systems and the Danish firm Terma. They're designed to boost the survivability of the non-stealthy fighters like the F-16 in contested environments. They add new more sophisticated jammers that can spoof radar signals of enemy missiles trying to lock onto the fighter. The 800 watt jammer are also powerful enough to confuse larger aircraft and ground-based radar sets. As if that wasn't enough, the pylons also feature ANAAR-60 missile warning systems that uses UV light from a missile's exhaust plume to detect a launch from all aspects, alerting the pilot that they've been targeted even without the signal from a radar lock. The pylon also provides additional flare and chaff decoys to the F-16 to help them evade missiles that do manage to get close. So it's clear the Fighting Falcon won't be a silver bullet that'll win the war overnight. But if Ukraine can use their new jets effectively, keeping them safe on the ground and properly mature the training and logistical pipeline for these jets, they may yet prove to be a crucial piece to their strategy. The Camp Gagon podcast is live now. I just was featured on. Go check it out. I put a link in the description of the video. He's from Flagrant 2. You might recognize him from his Andrew Schultz appearances with him and also his great YouTube channel. So uh, thank you guys for watching and check out one of these videos as well if you are interested.